The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 4, Side 1. The oldest known metal to be adapted to human use was copper. We find it in a lake dwelling at Robenhausen, Switzerland, circa 6000 B.C., in prehistoric Mesopotamia, circa 4500 B.C., in the Badarian graves of Egypt, towards 4000 B.C., in the ruins of Ur, circa 3100 B.C., and in the relics of the North American mound builders at an unknown age. The age of metals began not with their discovery, but with their transformation to human purpose by fire and working. Metallurgists believe that the first fusing of copper out of its stony ore came by haphazard when a primeval campfire melted the copper lurking in the rocks that enclosed the flames. Such an event has often been seen at primitive campfires in our own day. Possibly this was the hint which, many times repeated, led early man, so long content with refractory stone, to seek in this malleable metal a substance more easily fashioned into durable weapons and tools. Presumably the metal was first used as it came from the profuse but careless hand of nature, sometimes nearly pure, most often grossly alloyed. Much later, doubtless, apparently about 3500 B.C., in the region around the eastern Mediterranean, men discovered the art of smelting, of extracting metals from their ores. Then, towards 1500 B.C., as we may judge from bas-reliefs on the tomb of Rekmara in Egypt, they proceeded to cast metal. Dropping the molten copper into a clay or sand receptacle, they let it cool into some desired form, like a spearhead or an axe. That process, once discovered, was applied to a great variety of metals and provided man with those doughty elements that were to build his greatest industries and give him his conquest of the earth, the sea, and the air. Perhaps it was because the eastern Mediterranean lands were rich in copper that vigorous new cultures arose in the 4th millennium B.C., in Elam, Mesopotamia, and Egypt, and spread thence in all directions to transform the world. But copper by itself was soft, admirably pliable for some purposes. What would our electrified age do without it? But too weak for the heavier tasks of peace and war, an alloy was needed to harden it. Though nature suggested many and often gave man copper already mixed and hardened with tin or zinc, forming therefore ready-made bronze or brass, he may have dallied for centuries before taking the next step, the deliberate fusing of metal with metal to make compounds more suited to his needs. The discovery is at least 5,000 years old, for bronze is found in Cretan remains of 3,000 B.C., in Egyptian remains of 2,800 B.C., and in the second city of Troy, 2,000 B.C., we can no longer speak strictly of an age of bronze, for the metal came to different peoples at diverse epochs, and the term would therefore be without chronological meaning. Furthermore, some cultures, like those of Finland, northern Russia, Polynesia, Central Africa, southern India, North America, Australia, and Japan, passed over the Bronze Age directly from stone to iron. And in those cultures where bronze appears, it seems to have had a subordinate place as a luxury of priests, aristocrats, and kings— while commoners had still to be content with stone. Even the terms Old Stone Age and New Stone Age are precariously relative and describe conditions rather than times. To this day, many primitive peoples, for example the Eskimos and the Polynesian Islanders, remain in the Age of Stone, knowing iron only as a delicacy brought to them by explorers. Captain Cook bought several pigs for a sixpenny nail when he landed in New Zealand in 1778. And another traveler described the inhabitants of Dog Island as covetous chiefly of iron so as to want to take the nails out of the ship. Bronze is strong and durable, but the copper and tin which were needed to make it were not available in such convenient quantities and locations as to provide man with the best material for industry and war. Sooner or later iron had to come, and it is one of the anomalies of history that, being so abundant, it did not appear at least as early as copper and bronze. Men may have begun the art by making weapons out of meteoric iron, as the mound builders seem to have done, and as some primitive peoples do to this day. Then, perhaps they melted it from the ore by fire and hammered it into wrought iron. Fragments of apparently meteoric iron have been found in pre-dynastic Egyptian tombs, and Babylonian inscriptions mention iron as a costly rarity in Hammurabi's capital, 2100 B.C., an iron foundry perhaps 4,000 years old has been discovered in northern Rhodesia. Mining in South Africa is no modern invention. The oldest wrought iron known is a group of knives found at Gerar in Palestine and dated by Petrie about 1350 B.C. 
A century later, the metal appears in Egypt in the reign of the great Ramesses II. Still another century, and it is found in the Aegean. In Western Europe, it turns up first at Hallstatt, Austria, circa 900 B.C., and in Laten industry in Switzerland, circa 500 B.C. It entered India with Alexander, America with Columbus, Oceania with Cook. In this leisurely way, century by century, iron has gone about its rough conquest of the earth. 2. Writing Its possible ceramic origins, the Mediterranean signary, hieroglyphics, alphabets. But by far the most important step in the passage to civilization was writing. Bits of pottery from Neolithic remains show in some cases painted lines, which several students have interpreted as signs. This is doubtful enough, but it is possible that writing in the broad sense of graphic symbols of specific thoughts began with marks impressed by nails or fingers upon the still soft clay to adorn or identify pottery. In the earliest Sumerian hieroglyphics, the pictograph for bird bears a suggestive resemblance to the bird decorations on the oldest pottery at Susa, in Elam. And the earliest pictograph for grain is taken directly from the geometrical grain decoration of Susan and Sumerian vases. The linear script of Sumeria, on its first appearance, circa 3600 B.C., is apparently an abbreviated form of the signs and pictures painted or impressed upon the primitive pottery of Lower Mesopotamia and Elam. Writing, like painting and sculpture, is probably in its origin a ceramic art. It began as a form of etching and drawing, and the same clay that gave vases to the potter, figures to the sculptor and bricks to the builder, supplied writing materials to the scribe. From such a beginning to the cuneiform writing of Mesopotamia would be an intelligible and logical development. The oldest graphic symbols known to us are those found by Flinders Petrie on shards, vases, and stones discovered in the prehistoric tombs of Egypt, Spain, and the Near East, to which, with his usual generosity, he attributes an age of 7,000 years. This Mediterranean signory numbered some 300 signs. Most of them were the same in all localities, indicating commercial bonds from one end of the Mediterranean to the other as far back as 5,000 B.C., they were not pictures, but chiefly mercantile symbols, marks of property, quantity, or other business memoranda. The berated bourgeoisie may take consolation in the thought that literature originated in bills of lading. The signs were not letters, since they represented entire words or ideas, but many of them were astonishingly like letters of the Phoenician alphabet. Petrie concludes that a wide body of signs had been gradually brought into use in primitive times for various purposes, they were interchanged by trade and spread from land to land, until a couple of dozen signs triumphed and became common property to a group of trading communities, while the local survivals of other forms were gradually extinguished in isolated seclusion. That this signory was the source of the alphabet is an interesting theory, which Professor Petrie has the distinction of holding alone. Whatever may have been the development of these early commercial symbols, there grew up alongside them a form of writing which was a branch of drawing and painting, and conveyed connected thought by pictures. Rocks near Lake Superior still bear remains of the crude pictures with which the American Indians proudly narrated for posterity, or, more probably for their associates, the story of their crossing the mighty lake. A similar evolution of drawing into writing seems to have taken place throughout the Mediterranean world at the end of the Neolithic Age. Certainly by 3600 B.C., and probably long before that, Elam, Sumeria, and Egypt had developed a system of thought pictures— called hieroglyphics, because practiced chiefly by the priests. A similar system appeared in Crete circa 2500 B.C. We shall see later how these hieroglyphics, representing thoughts, were, by the corruption of use, schematized and conventionalized into syllabaries, i.e. collections of signs indicating syllables, and how at last signs were used to indicate not the whole syllable but its initial sound, and therefore became letters. Such alphabetic writing probably dates back to 3000 B.C. in Egypt. In Crete, it appears circa 1600 B.C. The Phoenicians did not create the alphabet, they marketed it. Taking it apparently from Egypt and Crete, they imported it piecemeal to Tyre, Sidon, and Byblos, and exported it to every city on the Mediterranean. They were the middlemen, not the producers of the alphabet. By the time of Homer, the Greeks were taking over this Phoenician, or the allied Aramaic alphabet, and were calling it by the Semitic names of the first two letters, Alpha, Beta, Hebrew, Aleph, Bet. 
Writing seems to be a product and convenience of commerce. Here again, culture may see how much it owes to trade. When the priests devised a system of pictures with which to write their magical, ceremonial, and medical formulas, the secular and clerical strains in history, usually in conflict, merged for a moment to produce the greatest human invention since the coming of speech. The development of writing almost created civilization by providing a means for the recording and transmission of knowledge, the accumulation of science, the growth of literature and the spread of peace and order among varied but communicating tribes brought by one language under a single state. The earliest appearance of writing marks that ever-receding point at which history begins. 3. Lost Civilizations Polynesia, Atlantis In approaching now the history of civilized nations, we must note that not only shall we be selecting a mere fraction of each culture for our study, but we shall be describing perhaps a minority of the civilizations that have probably existed on the earth. We cannot entirely ignore the legends, current throughout history, of civilizations once great and cultured, destroyed by some catastrophe of nature or war, and leaving not a rack behind. Our recent exhuming of the civilizations of Crete, Sumeria, and Yucatan indicates how true such tales may be. The Pacific contains the ruins of at least one of these lost civilizations— the gigantic statuary of Easter Island, the Polynesian tradition of powerful nations and heroic warriors once ennobling Samoa and Tahiti, the artistic ability and poetic sensitivity of their present inhabitants, indicate a glory departed, a people not rising to civilization but fallen from a high estate. And in the Atlantic, from Iceland to the South Pole, the raised central bed of the oceans lends some support to the legend so fascinatingly transmitted to us by Plato of a civilization that once flourished on an island continent between Europe and Asia, and was suddenly lost when a geological convulsion swallowed that continent into the sea. A submarine plateau from 2,000 to 3,000 meters below the surface runs north and south through the mid-Atlantic, surrounded on both sides by deeps of 5,000 to 6,000 meters. Schliemann, the resurrector of Troy, believed that Atlantis had served as a mediating link between the cultures of Europe and Yucatan, and that Egyptian civilization had been brought from Atlantis. Perhaps America itself was Atlantis, and some pre-Mayan culture may have been in touch with Africa and Europe in Neolithic times. Possibly, every discovery is a rediscovery. Certainly it is probable, as Aristotle thought, that many civilizations came, made great inventions and luxuries, were destroyed and lapsed from human memory. History, said Bacon, is the planks of a shipwreck, more of the past is lost than has been saved. We console ourselves with the thought that as the individual memory must forget the greater part of experience in order to be sane, so the race is preserved in its heritage only the most vivid and impressive, or is it only the best recorded, of its cultural experiments. Even if that racial heritage were but one-tenth as rich as it is, no one could possibly absorb it all. We shall find the story full enough. 4. Cradles of Civilization Central Asia, Anau, Lines of Dispersion. It is fitting that this chapter of unanswerable questions should end with the query, where did civilization begin, which is also unanswerable. If we may trust the geologists who deal with prehistoric mists as airy as any metaphysics, the arid regions of Central Asia were once moist and temperate, nourished with great lakes and abundant streams. The recession of the last ice wave slowly dried up this area, until the rainfall was insufficient to support towns and states. City after city was abandoned as men fled west and east, north and south, in search of water. Half buried in the desert lie ruined cities like Bactra, which must have held a teeming population within its twenty-two miles of circumference. As late as 1868, some 80,000 inhabitants of western Turkestan were forced to migrate because their district was being inundated by the moving sand. There are many who believe that these now dying regions saw the first substantial development of that vague complex of order and provision, manners and morals, comfort and culture which constitutes civilization. In 1907, Pompeli, unearthed at Anau in southern Turkestan, pottery and other remains of a culture which he has ascribed to 9000 BC with a possible exaggeration of 4000 years. Here we find the cultivation of wheat, barley and millet, the use of copper, the domestication of animals, and the ornamentation of pottery in styles so conventionalized as to suggest an artistic background and tradition of many centuries. Apparently the culture of Turkestan was already very old in 5000 BC. 
Perhaps it had historians who delved into its past in a vain search for the origins of civilization, and philosophers who eloquently mourned the degeneration of a dying race. From this center, if we may imagine, where we cannot know, a people driven by a rainless sky and betrayed by a desiccated earth migrated in three directions, bringing their arts and civilization with them. The arts, if not the race, reached eastward to China, Manchuria, and North America, southward to northern India, westward to Elam, Sumeria, Egypt, even to Italy and Spain. At Susa, in ancient Elam, modern Persia, remains have been found so similar in type to those at Anau that the recreative imagination is almost justified in presuming cultural communication between Susa and Anau at the dawn of civilization, circa 4000 B.C. A like kinship of early arts and products suggests a like relationship and continuity between prehistoric Mesopotamia and Egypt. We cannot be sure which of these cultures came first, and it does not much matter. They were in essence of one family and one type. If we violate honored precedents here and place Elam and Sumeria before Egypt, it is from no vainglory of unconventional innovation, but rather because the age of these Asiatic civilizations compared with those of Africa and Europe grows as our knowledge of them deepens. As the spades of archaeology after a century of victorious inquiry along the Nile pass across Suez into Arabia, Palestine, Mesopotamia, and Persia, it becomes more probable with every year of accumulating research that it was the rich delta of Mesopotamia's rivers that saw the earliest known scenes in the historic drama of civilization. Book One, The Near East At that time the gods called me, Hammurabi, the servant whose deeds are pleasing, who helped his people in time of need, who brought about plenty and abundance, to prevent the strong from oppressing the weak, to enlighten the land and further the welfare of the people. Code of Hammurabi, Prologue Chapter 7 Sumeria Orientation, Contributions of the Near East to Western Civilization Written history is at least 6,000 years old. During half of this period, the center of human affairs, so far as they are now known to us, was in the Near East. By this vague term, we shall mean here all southwestern Asia south of Russia and the Black Sea, and west of India and Afghanistan. Still more loosely, we shall include within it Egypt, too, as anciently bound up with the Near East in one vast web and communicating complex of Oriental civilization. In this rough theater of teeming peoples and conflicting cultures were developed the agriculture and commerce, the horse and wagon, the coinage and letters of credit, the crafts and industries, the law and government, the mathematics and medicine, the enemas and drainage systems, the geometry and astronomy, the calendar and clock and zodiac, the alphabet and writing, the paper and ink, the books and libraries and schools, the literature and music, the sculpture and architecture, the glazed pottery and fine furniture, the monotheism and monogamy, the cosmetics and jewelry, the checkers and dice, the tenpins and income tax, the wet nurses and beer, from which our own European and American culture derived by a continuous succession through the mediation of Crete and Greece and Rome. The Aryans did not establish civilization, they took it from Babylonia and Egypt. Greece did not begin civilization, it inherited far more civilization than it began. It was the spoiled heir of three millenniums of arts and sciences brought to its cities from the Near East by the fortunes of trade and war. In studying and honoring the Near East, we shall be acknowledging a debt long due to the real founders of European and American civilization. 1. Elam, the culture of Susa, the potter's wheel, the wagon wheel. If the reader will look at a map of Persia and will run his finger north along the Tigris, from the Persian Gulf to Amara, and then east across the Iraq border to the modern town of Shushan, he will have located the site of the ancient city of Susa, center of a region known to the Jews as Elam, the highland. In this narrow territory, protected on the west by marshes and on the east by the mountains that shoulder the great Iranian plateau, a people of unknown race and origin developed one of the first historic civilizations. Here, a generation ago, French archaeologists found human remains dating back 20,000 years, and evidences of an advanced culture as old as 4500 B.C. 
Professor Breasted believes that the antiquity of this culture and that of Anau has been exaggerated by de Morgan, Pompelli, and other students. Apparently the Elamites had recently emerged from a nomad life of hunting and fishing, that already they had copper weapons and tools, cultivated grains and domesticated animals, hieroglyphic writing and business documents, mirrors and jewelry, and a trade that reached from Egypt to India. In the midst of chipped flints that bring us back to the Neolithic age, we find finished vases elegantly rounded and delicately painted with geometric designs or with picturesque representations of animals and plants. Some of this pottery is ranked among the finest ever made by man. Here is the oldest appearance not only of the potter's wheel but of the wagon wheel. This modest but vital vehicle of civilization is found only later in Babylonia and still later in Egypt. From these already complex beginnings the Elamites rose to troubled power, conquering Sumeria and Babylon, and being conquered by them turn by turn. The city of Susa survived six thousand years of history, lived through the imperial zeniths of Sumeria, Babylonia, Egypt, Assyria, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and flourished under the name of Shushan as late as the fourteenth century of our era. At various times it grew to great wealth. When Ashurbanipal captured and sacked it, 646 B.C., his historians recounted without understatement the varied booty of gold and silver, precious stones and royal ornaments, costly garments and regal furniture, cosmetics and chariots, which the conqueror brought in his train to Nineveh. History so soon began its tragic alternance of art and war. 2. The Sumerians 1. The Historical Background The Exhuming of Sumeria, Geography, Race, Appearance, the Sumerian Flood, the Kings, an Ancient Reformer, Sargon of Akkad, the Golden Age of Ur. If we return to our map and follow the combined Tigris and Euphrates from the Persian Gulf to where these historic streams diverge, at modern Kurna, and then follow the Euphrates westward, we shall find, north and south of it, the buried cities of ancient Sumeria. Eridu, now Abu Sharain, Ur, now Mukayar, Uruk, biblical Erech, now Warka, Larsa, biblical Elesar, now Senkara, Lagash, now Shipurla, Nippur, Nifer, and Nizan. Follow the Euphrates northwest to Babylon, once the most famous city of Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers. Observe directly east of it Kish, site of the oldest culture known in this region, then pass some sixty miles farther up the Euphrates to Agada, capital in ancient days of the kingdom of Akkad. The early history of Mesopotamia is, in one aspect, the struggle of the non-Semitic peoples of Sumeria to preserve their independence against the expansion and inroads of the Semites from Kish and Agada and other centers in the north. In the midst of their struggles, these varied stocks, unconsciously, perhaps unwillingly, cooperated to produce the first extensive civilization known to history, and one of the most creative and unique. The unearthing of this forgotten culture is one of the romances of archaeology. To those whom, with a poor sense of the amplitude of time, we call the ancients, that is, to the Romans, the Greeks, and the Jews, Sumeria was unknown. Herodotus apparently never heard of it. If he did, he ignored it as something more ancient to him than he to us. Barossus, a Babylonian historian writing about 250 B.C., knew of Sumeria only through the veil of a legend. He described a race of monsters, led by one Oannes, coming out of the Persian Gulf and introducing the arts of agriculture, metalworking, and writing. All the things that make for the amelioration of life, he declares, were bequeathed to men by Oannes, and since that time no further inventions have been made. Not till two thousand years after Barossus was Sumeria rediscovered. In 1850, Hinks recognized that cuneiform writing, made by pressing a wedge-pointed stylus upon soft clay and used in the Semitic languages of the Near East, had been borrowed from an earlier people with a largely non-Semitic speech, and Oppert gave to this hypothetical people the name Sumerian. About the same time Rawlinson and his aides found, among Babylonian ruins, tablets containing vocabularies of this ancient tongue, with interlinear translations, in modern college style, from the older language into Babylonian. In 1854, two Englishmen uncovered the sites of Ur, Eridu, and Uruk. At the end of the 19th century, 
French explorers revealed the remains of Lagash, including tablets recording the history of the Sumerian kings, and in our own time, Professor Woolley of the University of Pennsylvania and many others have exhumed the primeval city of Ur, where the Sumerians appear to have reached civilization by 4500 B.C. So the students of many nations have worked together on this chapter of that endless mystery story in which the detectives are archaeologists and the prey is historic truth. Nevertheless, there has been as yet only a beginning of research in Sumeria, there is no telling what vistas of civilization and history will be opened up when the ground has been worked and the material studied, as men have worked and studied in Egypt during the last one hundred years. Despite much research, we cannot tell of what race the Sumerians were, nor by what route they entered Sumeria. Perhaps they came from Central Asia, or the Caucasus, or Armenia, and moved through northern Mesopotamia down the Euphrates and the Tigris, along which, as at Ashur, Evidences of their earliest culture have been found. Perhaps, as the legend says, they sailed in from the Persian Gulf, from Egypt or elsewhere, and slowly made their way up the great rivers. Perhaps they came from Susa, among whose relics is an asphalt head bearing all the characteristics of the Sumerian type. Perhaps even they were of remote Mongolian origin, for there is much in their language that resembles the Mongol speech. We do not know. The remains show them as a short and stocky people, with high, straight, non-Semitic nose, slightly receding forehead and downward-sloping eyes. Many wore beards, some were clean-shaven, most of them shaved the upper lip. They clothed themselves in fleece and finely woven wool. The women draped the garment from the left shoulder, the men bound it at the waist and left the upper half of the body bare. Later, the male dress crept up towards the neck with the advance of civilization, but servants, male and female, while indoors, continued to go naked from head to waist. The head was usually covered with a cap, and the feet were shod with sandals, but well-to-do women had shoes of soft leather, heelless, and laced like our own. Bracelets, necklaces, anklets, finger rings, and earrings made the women of Sumeria, as recently in America, show windows of their husband's prosperity. When their civilization was already old, about 2300 B.C., the poets and scholars of Sumeria tried to reconstruct its ancient history. The poets wrote legends of a creation, a primitive paradise and a terrible flood that engulfed and destroyed it because of the sin of an ancient king. This flood passed down into Babylonian and Hebrew tradition and became part of the Christian creed. In 1929, Professor Woolley, digging into the ruins of Ur, discovered at considerable depth an eight-foot layer of silt and clay— this, if we are to believe him, was deposited during a catastrophic overflow of the Euphrates, which lingered in later memory as the Flood. Beneath that layer were the remains of a pre-Diluvian culture that would later be pictured by the poets as a golden age. Meanwhile, the priest historians sought to create a past spacious enough for the development of all the marvels of Sumerian civilization. They formulated lists of their ancient kings, extending the dynasties before the Flood to 432,000 years, and told such impressive stories of two of these rulers, Tammuz and Gilgamesh, that the latter became the hero of the greatest poem in Babylonian literature, and Tammuz passed down into the pantheon of Babylon and became the Adonis of the Greeks. Perhaps the priests exaggerated a little the antiquity of their civilization. We may vaguely judge the age of Sumerian culture by observing that the ruins of Nippur are found to a depth of sixty-six feet, of which almost as many feet extend below the remains of Sargon of Akkad as rise above it to the topmost stratum, circa 1 A.D. On this basis, Nippur would go back to 5262 B.C. Tenacious dynasties of city kings seem to have flourished at Kish, circa 4500 B.C., and at Ur, circa 3500 B.C. In the competition of these two primeval centers, we have the first form of that opposition between Semite and non-Semite, which was to be one bloody theme of Near Eastern history from the Semitic ascendancy of Kish and the conquests of the Semitic kings Sargon I and Hammurabi, through the capture of Babylon by the Aryan generals Cyrus and Alexander in the 6th and 4th centuries before Christ, and the conflicts of Crusaders and Saracens for the Holy Sepulchre and the emoluments of trade, down to the efforts of the British government to dominate and pacify the divided Semites of the Near East today. From 3000 B.C. onward, the clay tablet records kept by the priests and found in the ruins of Ur present a reasonably accurate account of the accessions and coronations, uninterrupted victories and sublime deaths of the petty kings who ruled the city-states of Ur, Lagash, Uruk, and the rest. 
The writing of history and the partiality of historians are very ancient things. One king, Urukagina of Lagash, was a royal reformer, an enlightened despot who issued decrees aimed at the exploitation of the poor by the rich and of everybody by the priests. The high priest, says one edict, must no longer come into the garden of a poor mother and take wood therefrom, nor gather tax in fruit therefrom. Burial fees were to be cut to one-fifth of what they had been, and the clergy and high officials were forbidden to share among themselves the revenues and cattle offered to the gods. It was the king's boast that he gave liberty to his people, and surely the tablets that preserve his decrees reveal to us the oldest, briefest, and justest code of laws in history. This lucid interval was ended normally by one Lugal Zagisi, who invaded Lagash, overthrew Urukagina, and sacked the city at the height of its prosperity. The temples were destroyed, the citizens were massacred in the streets, and the statues of the gods were led away in ignominious bondage. One of the earliest poems in existence is a clay tablet, apparently 4,800 years old, on which the Sumerian poet Dingaradamu mourns for the raped goddess of Lagash. For the city, alas, the treasures my soul doth sigh. For my city, Girsu, Lagash, alas, the treasures my soul doth sigh. In holy Girsu the children are in distress. Into the interior of the splendid shrine he, the invader, pressed. The august queen from her temple he brought forth. O lady of my city, desolated, when wilt thou return? We pass by the bloody Lugal Zagisi and other Sumerian kings of mighty name, Lugal Shagengur, Lugal Kigubnidudu, Ninigi Dubti, Lugal Andanukunga. Meanwhile, another people of Semitic race had built the kingdom of Akkad under the leadership of Sargon I, and had established its capital at Agada, some two hundred miles northwest of the Sumerian city-states. A monolith found at Susa portrays Sargon armed with the dignity of a majestic beard and dressed in all the pride of long authority. His origin was not royal. History could find no father for him, and no other mother than a temple prostitute. Sumerian legend composed for him an autobiography quite mosaic in its beginning. My humble mother conceived me. In secret she brought me forth. She placed me in a basket boat of rushes. With pitch she closed my door. Rescued by a workman, he became a cupbearer to the king, grew in favor and influence, rebelled, displaced his master, and mounted the throne of Agada. He called himself king of universal dominion, and ruled a small portion of Mesopotamia. Historians call him the Great, for he invaded many cities, captured much booty, and killed many men. Among his victims was that same Lugal Zagasi, who had despoiled Lagash and violated its goddess. Him Sargon defeated and carried off to Nippur in chains. East and west, north and south, the mighty warrior marched, conquering Elam, washing his weapons in symbolic triumph in the Persian Gulf, crossing Western Asia, reaching the Mediterranean, and establishing the first great empire in history. For fifty-five years he held sway, while legends gathered about him and prepared to make him a god. His reign closed with all his empire in revolt. Three sons succeeded him in turn. The third, Naram-Sin, was a mighty builder of whose works nothing remains but a lovely stele, or memorial slab, recording his victory over an obscure king. This powerful relief, found by de Morgan at Susa in 1897, and now a treasure of the Louvre, shows a muscular Naram-Sin armed with bow and dart, stepping with royal dignity upon the bodies of his fallen foes, and apparently prepared to answer with quick death the appeal of the vanquished for mercy, while between them another victim, pierced through the neck with an arrow, falls dying. Behind them tower the Zagros Mountains, and on one hill is the record in elegant cuneiform of Naram-Sin's victory. Here the art of carving is already adult and confident, already guided and strengthened with a long tradition. To be burned to the ground is not always a lasting misfortune for a city. It is usually an advantage from the standpoint of architecture and sanitation. By the 26th century B.C., we find Lagash flourishing again, now under another enlightened monarch, Gudea, whose stocky statues are the most prominent remains of Sumerian sculpture. The diorite figure in the Louvre shows him in a pious posture, with his head crossed by a heavy band resembling a model of the Colosseum, hands folded in his lap, bare shoulders and feet, and short chubby legs covered by a bell-like skirt embroidered with a volume of hieroglyphics. The strong but regular features reveal a man thoughtful and just, firm and yet refined. Gudea was honored by his people not as a warrior, 
but as a Sumerian Aurelius devoted to religion, literature, and good works. He built temples, promoted the study of classical antiquities in the spirit of the expeditions that unearthed him, and tempered the strength of the strong in mercy to the weak. One of his inscriptions reveals the policy for which his people worshipped him after his death as a god. During seven years the maidservant was the equal of her mistress, the slave walked beside his master, and in my town the weak rested by the side of the strong. Meanwhile, Ur of the Chaldees was having one of the most prosperous epochs in its long career from 3500 B.C., the apparent age of its oldest graves, to 700 B.C. Its greatest king, Ur-Engur, brought all Western Asia under his Pacific sway and proclaimed for all Sumeria the first extensive code of laws in history. By the laws of righteousness of Shamash forever I established justice. As Ur grew rich by the trade that flowed through it on the Euphrates, Ur-Engur, like Pericles, beautified his city with temples and built lavishly in the subject cities of Larsa, Uruk, and Nippur. His son Dungi continued his work through a reign of fifty-eight years and ruled so wisely that the people deified him as the god who had brought back their ancient paradise. But soon that glory faded. The warlike Elamites from the east and the rising Amorites from the west swept down upon the leisure, prosperity, and peace of Ur, captured its king, and sacked the city with primitive thoroughness. The poets of Ur sang sad chants about the rape of the statue of Ishtar, their beloved mother goddess, torn from her shrine by profane invaders. The form of these poems is unexpectedly first personal, and the style does not please the sophisticated ear, but across the four thousand years that separate us from the Sumerian singer, we feel the desolation of his city and his people. Me the foe hath ravished, yea, with hands unwashed. Me his hands have ravished, made me die of terror. Oh, I am wretched. Naught of reverence hath he. Stripped me of my robes, and clothed therein his consort. Tore my jewels from me, therewith decked his daughter. Now I tread his courts, my very person sought he in the shrines. Alas, the day when to go forth I trembled. He pursued me in my temple, he made me quake with fear. There within my walls and like a dove that fluttered, percheth on a rafter, like a flitting owlet in a cavern hidden, bird-like from my shrine he chased me. From my city like a bird he chased me, me sighing, far behind, behind me is my temple. So for two hundred years, which to our self-centered eyes seem but an empty moment, Elam and Amor ruled Sumeria. Then from the north came the great Hammurabi, king of Babylon, retook from the Elamites, Uruk and Ezin, bided his time for twenty-three years, invaded Elam and captured its king, established his sway over Amur and distant Assyria, built an empire of unprecedented power, and disciplined it with a universal law. For many centuries now, until the rise of Persia, the Semites would rule the land between the rivers. Of the Sumerians nothing more is heard. Their little chapter in the book of history was complete. 2. Economic life, the soil, industry, trade, classes, science. But Sumerian civilization remained. Sumer and Akkad still produced handicraftsmen, poets, artists, sages, and saints. The culture of the southern cities passed north along the Euphrates and the Tigris to Babylonia and Assyria as the initial heritage of Mesopotamian civilization. At the basis of this culture was a soil made fertile by the annual overflow of rivers swollen with the winter rains. The overflow was perilous as well as useful. The Sumerians learned to channel it safely through irrigation canals that ribbed and crossed their land, and they commemorated those early dangers by legends that told of a flood and how at last the land had been separated from the waters and mankind had been saved. This irrigation system, dating from 4000 B.C., was one of the great achievements of Sumerian civilization, and certainly its foundation. Out of these carefully watered fields came abounding crops of corn, barley, spelt, dates, and many vegetables. The plow appeared early, drawn by oxen as even with us until yesterday, and already furnished with a tubular seed drill. Gathered harvest was threshed by drawing it over great sledges of wood armed with flint teeth that cut the straw for the cattle and released the grain for men. It was in many ways a primitive culture. The Sumerians made some use of copper and tin and occasionally mixed them to produce bronze. Now and then they went so far as to make large implements of iron. But metal was still a luxury and a rarity. Most Sumerian tools were of flint. Some, like the sickles for cutting the barley, were of clay, 
and certain finer articles, such as needles and awls, used ivory and bone. Weaving was done on a large scale under the supervision of overseers appointed by the king after the latest fashion of governmentally controlled industry. Houses were made of reeds, usually plastered with an adobe mixture of clay and straw moistened with water and hardened by the sun. Such dwellings are still easy to find in what was once Sumeria. The hut had wooden doors, revolving upon socket hinges of stone. The floors were ordinarily the beaten earth. The roofs were arched by bending the reeds together at the top or were made flat with mud-covered reeds stretched over crossbeams of wood. Cows, sheep, goats, and pigs roamed about the dwelling in primeval comradeship with man. Water for drinking was drawn from wells. Goods were carried chiefly by water. Since stone was rare in Sumeria, it was brought up the gulf or down the rivers and then through numerous canals to the quays of the cities. But land transportation was developing. At Kish, the Oxford Field Expedition unearthed some of the oldest wheeled vehicles known. Here and there in the ruins are business seals bearing indications of traffic with Egypt and India. There was no coinage yet, and trade was normally by barter, but gold and silver were already in use as standards of value and were often accepted in exchange for goods, sometimes in the form of ingots and rings of definite worth, but generally in quantities measured by weight in each transaction. Many of the clay tablets that have brought down to us fragments of Sumerian writing are business documents revealing a busy commercial life. One tablet speaks, with fin de siècle weariness, of the city where the tumult of man is. Contracts had to be confirmed in writing and duly witnessed. A system of credit existed by which goods, gold or silver might be borrowed, interest to be paid in the same material as the loan, and at rates ranging from 15 to 33 percent per annum. Since the stability of a society may be partly measured by inverse relation with the rate of interest, we may suspect that Sumerian business, like ours, lived in an atmosphere of economic and political uncertainty and doubt. Gold and silver have been found abundantly in the tombs, not only as jewelry, but as vessels, weapons, ornaments, even as tools. Rich and poor were stratified into many classes and gradations. Slavery was highly developed, and property rights were already sacred. Between the rich and the poor, a middle class took form, composed of small businessmen, scholars, physicians, and priests. Medicine flourished and had a specific for every disease, but it was still bound up with theology and admitted that sickness, being due to possession by evil spirits, could never be cured without the exorcising of these demons. A calendar of uncertain age and origin divided the year into lunar months, adding a month every three or four years to reconcile the calendar with the seasons and the sun. Each city gave its own names to the months. 3. Government. The kings, ways of war, the feudal barons, law. Indeed, each city, as long as it could, maintained a jealous independence and indulged itself in a private king. It called him patesi, or priest-king, indicating by the very word that government was bound up with religion. By 2800 B.C. the growth of trade made such municipal separatism impossible and generated empires in which some dominating personality subjected the cities and their patesis to his power and wove them into an economic and political unity. The despot lived in a renaissance atmosphere of violence and fear. At any moment he might be dispatched by the same methods that had secured him the throne. He dwelt in an inaccessible palace whose two entrances were so narrow as to admit only one person at a time to the right and left were recesses from which secret guards could examine every visitor or pounce upon him with daggers. Even the king's temple was private, hidden away in his palace, so that he might perform his religious duties without exposure, or neglect them inconspicuously. The king went to battle in a chariot, leading a motley host armed with bows, arrows, and spears. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.